Hey, how's it going? Before we jump into the content, I just want to take a minute to thank you for stopping by the channel and checking out the content. If you like this content and you want to support more content like it, then make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video. You can also check out the YouTube membership program and cybertrainingpro.com where I put practice exams and other things that I couldn't put on YouTube. Again, regardless of how you support the channel and my content, I couldn't be more appreciative. Thank you so much, and let's get into the content. When it comes to security, one of the foundational concepts that you need to understand is the CIA triad. Now, the CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and essentially our goal is to protect each one of these components. The first component of the CIA triad is confidentiality, which means to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of data. Basically, we want to make sure that only people who are approved can see and understand data and prevent everybody else from seeing it. So what are the ways that we can ensure confidentiality? Well, the two most popular ways are encryption and access controls. With encryption, we essentially scramble the data so that only authorized people can read or understand what the data says. For example, if we had a message that said, hello world, but the encrypted version was something like A-Z-X-Y-B-2-F-G. We aren't gonna dive deep into encryption right now, but don't worry, we will. And then access controls allow us to logically control who has access to data. With access controls, there's a few important concepts that you need to understand. First, we start off by identification of a user by asking for their username, who we'll call John. Next, we're gonna ask John to perform authentication by providing his password associated with his username. Finally, we provide authorization, meaning that we grant certain permissions to John and he can access certain files and folders. This whole process creates an audit trail known as accounting, so then we can recreate that timeline if we need to, and that completes the IAAA process. The second part of the CIA triad is to provide integrity, which means that we can say with certainty that data hasn't been changed unless it's been done by an authorized user. When an unauthorized change occurs, we say that data has lost its integrity. The primary method for verifying data integrity is gonna be with hashing. Now hashing runs a mathematical algorithm against data, which then creates a unique value. If any part of that data changes, the hash value is gonna be different when we run that algorithm again. If the data hasn't changed, the hash value is always gonna be the same. Hashing can be used in a lot of different situations, such as messages, files, or even software executables. You might've seen something called a checksum provided by a software developer that verify the integrity of your download. The third and final piece of the CIA triad is increasing availability, which means that we try to make our data and services available when our users need them. So what are some of the strategies that we can use to increase availability? Redundancy is a term that you need to be familiar with, and essentially it means that you have backup or alternate systems so that everything keeps running. That also means that our systems are fault tolerant and can sustain a fault, yet keep running. When we talk about redundancy, we're also removing single points of failure because no single system crashing is gonna result in our entire operation going down. Several types of redundancy include disk redundancy or RAID that prevents us from losing data. We have server redundancies where we have backup servers to use. Network redundancies like load balancers to prevent bottlenecking or overloading of network traffic. And then power redundancies like UPSs or uninterruptible power supplies that will still operate if power goes out. Scalability refers to our ability to add hardware resources like memory, processing power, and overall capacity. We can scale up or we can scale out, meaning that we can either add to our existing hardware, like adding RAM, or we can add additional nodes. Scalability is generally a term that refers to the manual expansion of resources. Elasticity allows us to dynamically increase resources based on our workload. If we see a spike in traffic, we can easily expand to meet that demand. Elasticity is a huge benefit of using the cloud because we can set things up to automatically provision resources as we need them. Patching or installing updates is not only a good practice to get the latest features, but it also helps to eliminate bugs or security issues that result in crashes. An issue with high availability is it comes at a cost to the business. Resiliency is a technique to allow systems to heal themselves or recover from faults with minimal downtime. Think of resiliency as adding a retry option on failed processes in case it was just a rare situation. Ultimately, security is a balancing act between the available resources or budget and what we need to be secure. It's not uncommon for us to present a security control or a strategy to leadership, only to have it declined based on accepting the risk as is. I don't want you to be disappointed if this happens because it's just part of the job. At the end of the day, our job in security is to reduce risk to the business. Now, risk is the likelihood or probability that a threat will successfully exploit a vulnerability, which will result in a loss. Threats are any circumstance or event that can impact the confidentiality, integrity, or the availability of the organization. 
Threats can be intentional, like a hacker. They can also be unintentional, like a poorly trained employee. They can even be natural, like a hurricane. Vulnerabilities and weakness in technology, like hardware or software, or non-technology areas, like policies or procedures. Security controls are what we implement to reduce risk. Just about anything that you can think of from policies to technical controls like antivirus software is a control. Control categories are a way of breaking down controls, essentially based on how they're implemented. So what are the different control categories that we need to know about? Managerial controls are administrative in nature and are documented in an organization's security policy. Two managerial controls that you need to know about include risk assessments, which are attempts to identify all known risks and help us to prioritize resource allocation based on their monetary value or criticality. And vulnerability assessments, which discover current vulnerabilities in our networks. Operational controls ensure that day-to-day -day operations comply with security policies. Typically, operational controls are gonna be implemented by people versus using technology. Some examples include awareness training for things like not opening email attachments and password security, configuration management, which makes sure that systems start in a secure state when they're deployed, and then the configuration management process monitors all approved changes. Media protection regarding the use and handling of USB flash drives, backup tapes, and other media. And physical and environmental protections, such as cameras and heating and ventilation systems. Technical controls use some form of technology, like hardware or software, to reduce vulnerabilities. Technical controls should perform their function automatically without human intervention. Some common examples include encryption to protect the confidentiality of data, antivirus software to prevent malicious software from being introduced into the network, IDSs or intrusion detection systems, and IPSs or intrusion prevention systems to detect malicious traffic or activity, firewalls to permit or deny traffic based on rules, and least privilege, meaning that users have the access they need to do their job and nothing more. We know about the categories of controls, but controls are also broken down further into control types, which describe the purpose of the control and what they ultimately accomplish. Keep in mind for your exam and your career that a single control could fall into multiple categories. Preventative controls try to prevent incidents from happening. Some examples include hardening systems by applying secure configurations, trainings such as user awareness training on social engineering, security guards who monitor the facility, change management to control changes and only allow those that will not cause outages, account disablement policy to disable user access when somebody is terminated from the company, and intrusion prevention systems or IPSs to block malicious network traffic. Detective controls can help us detect an incident after it's already occurred. Some examples include log monitoring, which allows us to see spikes in traffic so that we can further analyze it for malicious activity, security information and event management, or SIM tools, which allow us to correlate events, meaning that we can actually track an attacker's history through our network across many systems. Security audits, which provide us an evaluation of how well our security is working and complying with policies. Video surveillance will record activity, and if we have somebody monitoring it, it can help us identify when we need to alert the authorities. Motion detection can set off alarms if potential intruders are in an area. And intrusion detection systems, or IDSs, will detect malicious activity and generate an alarm. Corrective controls attempt to reverse the impact of an incident. Some examples include backups and system recovery that allow us to revert a system back to a previous point in time, and incident handling processes to find steps to take in response to security incidents. Physical controls are controls that we can physically touch. Some examples include lighting, man traps, signs, and fences. And the image that we have on the screen here is a man trap, and it's a room version. So you go in one door, and that door closes, and then you have to show your badge, or enter a pin, or do your fingerprint, or something like that. And then a guard will look at you, and verify you, and then let you in through that next door. The other style that you can have is also like a turn style, where only one person can go in at a time. Deterrent controls aim to deter or discourage people from doing something that's gonna cause an incident. Some examples include security guards. Cable locks might be vulnerable to cable cutters, but that means the intruder needs to actually carry those on them. And physical locks can be too time consuming for an attacker to even attempt to break. Compensating controls provide additional protection to make up for the gaps that the primary control creates. An example is time-based one-time passwords, which is a very commonly referenced compensating control in organizations that use smart cards, which might take a while to issue, so you can give a temporary password. As we go through any kind of controls, I want you to keep in mind the strategy of defense in depth. Defense in depth or layered security is the strategy of implementing several layers of security so that if one fails, there's another to help prevent successful attacks. For example, you might have gates and guards to the facility, and then on individual doors, you have proximity readers for badges to scan. There's three main strategies when it comes to defense in depth. The first strategy is vendor diversity, 
meaning that you should have multiple vendors on your security controls. For example, if you have three firewalls, you probably shouldn't have all three firewalls be made by Cisco. The second is technology diversity, which means that you implement different technologies in your controls. For example, you have a surveillance system for video and audio, and then you use proximity readers for badge access. The third strategy is control diversity, meaning that you have different control types consisting of technical, physical, and administrative controls. For example, we have a guard at the front door checking badges, proximity readers for badges on doors, and policies saying that you must have your badge on you at all times. Although CompTIA exams generally don't require a lot of hands-on experience, you'll want to be familiar with the tools and commands that we're going to cover. The first several commands that we're going to review can be helpful for us to troubleshoot and maintain our networks, but attackers can also use these tools to map out our network and identify where devices are at. Ping is a command typically used for testing connectivity of remote systems. Now, Ping operates with the ICMP or Internet Control Message Protocol by sending echo request packets, and then remote systems will send echo reply packets. Keep in mind that just because the system doesn't respond, that doesn't mean the system is down, and there could be a firewall blocking your packets. Windows systems by default are known for blocking ICMP packets. HPing takes the functionality of Ping and also allows you to send pings with TCP and UDP packets. This can be a useful tool if you think a firewall is blocking ICMP traffic. IPconfig, short for Internet Protocol Configuration, shows information about a local system, such as the IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, MAC address, and the domain name system, or DNS server, for all network interface cards that are installed on that system. Now, IPconfig is for Windows. On Linux, you have ifconfig, which is short for interface configuration. Keep in mind that some commands might require administrator or pseudo level privileges. IP is the replacement command for ifconfig, which has been deprecated, meaning it's no longer supported. Netstat, short for network statistics, is a command that shows TCP IP stats, including active network connections on a system. This is important because a lot of attacks involve connections with a remote computer system. You can combine options or flags like you see on the screen here. And another useful command that you could do is the same command, but add a P and then a space and TCP, which will show ports listening for TCP. Some of the different statuses that you'll see are established, which indicates an open session. Listen means that that system is waiting for a connection. Close wait indicates the system is waiting for a termination request. Time wait is allowing the remote system time to receive the TCP connection. Send sent indicates the send packet for a TCP connection was sent by this system. And send received, meaning that the system is waiting for the final act packet to form the TCP connection. Trace RT will show all the routers, which are also known as hops between two different systems. Trace route is the Linux equivalent command. Like all commands, there's multiple uses for traceroute. Network administrators can use it for troubleshooting network issues. Security staff can identify where traffic is routing through. Obviously, if you find traffic is routing through another country, something might be wrong. You should probably look at it. And attackers can use the command to identify network appliances that exist. Path ping combines ping and trace RT into a single tool. Path ping followed by the IP address or path ping dash in followed by the IP address are two common commands. Path ping is only available on Windows systems. The ARP tool is related to the address resolution protocol. One of the commands that you can use that's pretty popular is ARP-A, and that will show you all the MAC addresses that your system knows about on the local network. As a security professional, you'll also need to know Linux and Unix specific commands to do various things on the command line. These next commands are only found in Linux and Unix. Cat, which is short for concatenate, can be used to show the contents of files. Common usage of cat is the cat command followed by the file name. The main con of using the cat command is that it's gonna show everything in a file. So if you have a long file, that might not be the most effective command. More and less are similar commands to cat in that they're gonna display information in a file, but they're more friendly for viewing large amounts of data section by section. The syntax for each command is more or less, so whichever command you wanna use, followed by the file name. Grep, which is short for globally search, a regular expression in print, can be used to search for a string or pattern of text within a file. We have a sample command here on the screen if you wanted to search for the username root in the password file on Linux. The pipe command that we just used allows you to use the output of one command as the input for another command. We just use the cat command first and then use grep to search the contents, although we can use the pipe command with any commands. The pipe is used by pressing shift and the key above your inner key on the keyboard. The head command can be useful if you want to see the beginning of a file, like a security log. By default, the command is going to show you the first 10 lines of the file. So if you just use the command head space, 
the file that you want to see, it's just going to show you the first 10 lines. The tail command is going to show you the last 10 lines of a file. You can also specify the amount of lines that you want to show if you want to see more than 10. So you can use the flag dash n and the amount of lines that you want to see. In certain circumstances, you might want to add entries to the syslog file. With logger, you can do exactly that by typing the command logger space and then whatever text you want to put in there. Journal CTL is a command that queries the Linux system logging utility called journal D and will display log entries from multiple sources. Occasionally, there might be a need to change permissions on Linux files or folders, and with Chmod, we can do exactly that. Before I show you how to use the command, let's talk about Linux permissions. Within Linux and Unix, there's three basic sets of permissions. We have read, which has a numeric value of four. We have write, which has a numeric value of two. And we have execute with a numeric value of one. No permissions or no access has a numeric value of zero. We assign permissions in the following order. The owner user of the file or folder is represented by a U. The owner group of the file or folder is represented by a G. And the world or everybody else is represented by an O. There's two different ways to assign permissions with Chmod. The first way is to use numbers. So you can add up the numbers that you want and put those in the correct category. So the user, the group, and the world. So seven would be all permissions. The second way is to use the letter representation. So G equals R would set group to read. U plus X, as another example, would set that file for the user to be able to execute it. And then O minus X would remove execute for the world. Next, we're gonna talk about different types of logs that track activity in various locations. Being aware of various logs is an important skill within the security profession because we review them in detail when something goes wrong or if we need to research an event. Windows has three main logs to store information. The first one is the application log, which is gonna record events related to applications like warnings, errors, or routine messages. We have the security log, which is gonna store security related events like auditing file access or login events, just to name a couple. There are many different audit events that you can actually turn on. So that's also something you wanna look into. And then we have the system log, which stores events that are related to the operating system, like shutdown events, start and stopping services, and drivers that are loading or failing to load. You can see the log file location here on the screen. Local Windows logs can't be viewed with a text editor, and you have to view them using the Windows Event Log Viewer, PowerShell, or a special application, like a SIM tool. When it comes to Linux logs, the main location that they're stored in is the var slash log directory. Linux logs are viewable by using commands like cat on the command line, which is different than Windows. And you can see some of the locations that are important here on the screen. Many of our networking appliances like routers, switches, and firewalls are gonna log network activity as traffic passes through them. Some of the information that they capture includes source IP and port, destination IP and port, MAC address, timestamps, and if the traffic was permitted or denied. Reviewing local logs can be manageable for a single system. However, as your network grows in size, we need to send the information to a central system for easy analysis and correlation. Security information and event management or SIM tools are database-like systems that gather information from all your nodes or systems and they store them in a central location. These systems are feature rich and can contain functions for both IT staff and security staff to act on. It's also common for SIM systems to be able to generate tickets for your ticketing system. SIM tools are nice because they allow log aggregation of every device and they make it easy to correlate or link events together to identify what's occurring on your network. The syslog protocol is used for a general format of log entries and it works in a similar way to SIM tools by capturing events from many systems. Syslog events are sent to a syslog server where they can then be analyzed. Syslog uses either UDP port 514 or newer implementations might use TCP port 6514 over a TLS encrypted connection. And then on the screen here, I've included the main two locations for syslog on Linux systems. Two alternate tools for using the normal syslog D are syslog ng, which adds some capabilities like correlation and routing abilities, and then R syslog, which improves upon the features of syslog ng. If you want a syslog tool that adds support for Windows logs, then nxlog can be helpful. nxlog can also collect your logs and integrate into a SIM system.